get started shortly. Um, would it be okay if I... So, the first STEM speaker talk of spring 2015. And to let you know, the STEM speaker series has been going on for four years now. It is the fourth Tuesday at 11.10, repeated, so tell your friends this talk will be repeated, at 5 o'clock on the fourth Tuesday of October, November, February, March, and April of every academic year. Coming up next month in March, Dr. Steve Aquilani of our bio department is going to give a talk on biology and ecology, which should be very interesting. And in April, the last talk of this academic year, I'll be giving a talk on my favorite number, the number two, and how it occurs in biology, chemistry, physics, philosophy, religion, magic, computer science and mathematics. So everything you always wanted to know about the number two, but were afraid to ask. So I'm going to pass around a roster which I will scan this evening and email to all faculty. So it'll circulate starting here, make it to one side, then the other, and then Deb eventually to you, and then back to me. Put your name down, and next to your name, there's a column for the professor for whom you might be getting extra credit, or if you're not getting extra credit, just your name alone, or name and professor, have a seat please. And make sure it circulates around so that you all sign in, not only for the extra credit, so we have a sense of how many people are attending these talks. So I'll start it here. I'd now like to introduce our speaker, who's going to give a talk on molecular biology for physicists, so a single molecule pers perspective. The cell is filled with an array of nanoscale machines. The shell is filled with the, the cell is filled with all sorts of microscopic machines made of DNA, RNA, and amino acids. The question is, how can we study these molecules on relevant time scales? What tools can a physicist bring to these kind of problems arising in biology? Dr. File, our speaker, will use his research into the protein folding problem, which he will explain, which combines single molecule fluorescence and microfluidic mixers to address these questions. In particular, he'll discuss how the ability to measure one molecule at a time is leading to new insights in the folding problem. Dr. File obtained his PhD in physics from the University of California, Santa Barbara. He did postdoctoral research and is continuing to do so at UPenn. And he is currently a professor of physics at Westchester University. So ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Sean File. And what, what I'm going to try and do today is, is go for sort of a case study of what, why you have a physicist doing biology. It's basically, I do biology in some real sense. Um, so the question is, what am I doing there, right? Um, I like biology. I actually thought I was going to be a bio major originally when I went to college. I signed up to be a bio major. And then my senior year, I took a physics class that I really liked and changed my major up the second day I was on campus. And then I thought I was going to do something else for a while. And I came back to biology in grad school. So in some sense, I've come full circle here. Um, so what I'd like to start with is, is just sort of thinking about what's happening in molecular biology and, and why, if you're a physicist, you, you care. Because physics is sort of the study of energy and forces, and it doesn't really seem like there's a lot of biology there. But if we sort of look inside the cell, and we can't actually like peer inside the cell on the scales if you want to, we'll talk about that in a second. But we're going to look inside the cell via sort of a cartoon done by David Goodsell which draws these really great sort of scale pictures. Um, and here, this is a E. coli cell. It's from the machinery of life. Here's the cell wall. Here's one of these flagellar motors, which is this really amazing sort of rotary motor driven by a current. All right, so now this is already starting to... I'm getting a little feedback here. You know, I'm just gonna try and talk loud. 
Can you hear me if I talk like this? Okay, I'm just gonna do that so I don't get feedback. Okay, so it's already starting to sound a little bit more like physics, right? Because we have some current going through and there's a motor, right? And so, okay, this is starting to sound better, for, for me at least, for, as a physicist, right? But the, the, um, the other thing here, right, is if we look here, there's actually all this stuff going on. I mean, we think about the cell as some bag with chemistry in it, but that's not really true. There's all this structure, right? So over here, here we have DNA, and it's all wound up tight around these histones, which are proteins, which their job is to wind DNA up tight, because otherwise it'd just be, it'd be too long in the cell, right? And then going on in here, like, so let's see, here's one of these polymerases, which is working along the DNA, and what it's doing is it's taking the DNA, and it's making RNA, right? It's making RNA molecules. So it's taking one molecule, and it's making another, right? So one of these things is making another. And then out here in the cytosol, we have, what's okay? Here in the cell, I guess it's a bacteria, so we don't really have the separation between the nucleus and the cytosol. You can tell I'm a physicist, right? You're, you're like, yeah, you're a physicist, right? You almost said it. But I call myself here, it's okay. All right, um, we have ribosomes, and they're, they're reading this mRNA transcript, and they're making proteins. And then everything else, basically, in this picture it is, is most, mostly just proteins. And proteins are these small machines, they're sort of nanoscale machines, which do things in the cell. Right. Some of them take ATP, which is a store of chemical energy, and then they actually generate force. Now that sounds maybe like something for this to be interested in, right? We've got force, chemical energy is going to generate force, that's good. That sounds more like physics. Um, some of them are being used as structural members, so they're actually making the skeleton for the cell, the sort of rigid structure. Okay, that sounds a little bit more like physics. And, then, and so from this point of view, we have these really interesting machines which have evolved to do things in the cell. They're teeny sort of nanoscale machines. And now this is starting to sound like something a physicist might be interested in, right? So I've got little machines doing things, right? Um, that's exciting to me, right? So, but, but what we're gonna take a step back here, and we're gonna go back and we're gonna say, okay, so we have these machines and they're mostly made out of protein. And if we wanted to make sense of this picture, this is a pretty complicated picture, right? One way we can make sense of it is to sort of think about information flow, right? And I'm going to show you a very simplified picture of information flow in the cell, which you know, sort of a physicist's picture of this, right? Which is that you start with DNA, and we all sort of know now that your genetic information is encoded in DNA, and it's stored there, right? So you have genetic information stored in DNA, um, and then that's transcribed into RNA, like I was talking about, and then the RNA gets translated into protein, okay? This is a very simplified view because Okay, if I was going to do the real view of this, I'd have to draw more arrows, right? You know, like, so, for instance, we have these reverse transcriptases for some uh, viruses. For instance, like, I think HIV is one of the most popular, maybe not popular is the wrong word there, most uh, well-known, infamous of these viruses, right, which actually has its genome, if you want to call that, as RNA. So I really should put another arrow that way. And then we also know that there's all this regulation of DNA transcription, which happens based on methylation states of the, you can actually have your DNA get marked, which is going to regulate whether or not it gets trans, transcribed, so there's some feedback here, and we could, we'd have to draw all kinds of errors on it, right? As our, as our, as often is the case in biology, as our understanding increases, everything gets more and more complicated, right? Okay, so that's fine, but we're still going to go have this sort of basic idea that we have transcription, translation, and then we're gonna have our protein here. But there's one thing which we haven't really talked about, which is okay, um, if we take a step back here, you have nucleic acids, they're heteropolymers, if I wanna talk like a polymer physicist. What I mean there is that they're made out of different pieces, right, so they're strung together. Here we could have, you know, G, C, U, and A, those are our different pieces we're stringing together. And if we look at this, we're gonna be able to say, okay, um, if I have G, C, U, in this process, that's going to code for one monomer here, an amino acid alanine, right? So our genetic information is written in this alphabet with these letters, and then we take three letters and we're going to get out, one, that's going to be the instruction to make a protein to put that, that residue there, that's what we call alanine. Um, and if we go to the protein, okay, so now we go to the protein and say, okay, what am I talking about here? We have another one of these polymers, right, with a bunch of different possible parts in it, um, and they all, all of the amino acids, which are what the parts are, look basically the same, except that they, you know, they have a carboxylic acid group, an 
an amino group, and those are involved in sticking these things together, so you can stick them together to make this chain. Okay? Um, but what, they're, what they differ in is the side group here. So the side group could be, a, a, it could be acidic, it could be basic, it could be sort of polar, if you want to think about it being fatty, polar. Um, or it could be, um, okay. polar is actually the other way around. That's not, it's, that's a, yeah. So polar is if it's charged. Here I'm thinking of a hydrophobic. Right. Hydrophobic, maybe we'll, we'll say there. So more oily. So it could be oily or sort of charged. Yeah, yeah, so you can have oily ones, right? Aromatic is what I'm thinking of, actually, aromatic there. So aromatic ones there, and they're hydrophobic. Or you could have charged ones. And the point is, is that we have all this different chemical functionality, and here you get to see that on the physicist, right? Because I'm like, oh, okay. Right, so, uh, so we have all this different functionality, and the idea is that I have this long string of different chemical groups, right? And I want to use this to make something which is going to have a function for me. But in order to have this make a function for me, I'm going to have to arrange them in one three-dimensional configuration. Right? Or if nature wants to have a function, we need to arrange them in one three-dimensional configuration. So we have this chain. So far we've had this linear arrangement of information. Right? Maybe I have an alanine and a valine, or alanine, valine, valine, alanine, some other residues in there, and I want that to fold into a three-dimensional shape. So this 1D sequence is going to yield some 3D structure, and this is the protein folding problem. How does that work? Thank you. Right. How do we go from a 1D sequence to a 3D structure? What rules are involved? This is a spontaneous process. These things will fold on their own. Right. So you can put them in some nasty chemical to make them unfold, like urea or guanidinium chloride, and then you dilute it out, and they'll refold to their native structure. Their folded state, their naturally occurring state. And the problem at simplest point sort of statement is how can we understand this? Could we make a sequence of these amino acids from scratch? So we write one down, we synthesize it, and get it to fold into what we want. That would be a complete understanding of the folding problem. If you can engineer it, so it works. Um, and the answer is that we've made a lot of progress in understanding this, but we don't know how to do that. We don't know how to write down a sequence and really have it fold into what we want. So, and this is where sort of my involvement in this comes in is, okay, so what we'd like to be able to do is we'd like to be able to just look at this. Right? If we could experimentally look at this process. Let's say I could just look at proteins folding. I'm just going to look. If I could watch a video of proteins folding, then I'd be able to find out a lot about protein folding, right? I mean, if I can watch a video of a horse running, I can find out a lot about horses. And so we'd like to be able to do that. There are some issues, though, right? One is that, okay, we want to be able to look at one protein at a time, because I don't want to have some averaging over what's going on. Um, proteins are small. They're smaller than the wavelength of light, so I can't just use a regular microscope. Right? And this folding, okay, this folded state is very strongly favored. If you have this thing and you put it under normal conditions, it will fold or at least it's favored enough that we're not going to have a lot of unfolded protein sitting around under native conditions. If it worked that way, then you know that's not very efficient for biology. Now, I am sweeping some things under the rug for efficient optimus, right? There are proteins which spend a lot of their time unfolded and then bind to things and fold, right? Intrinsically disordered proteins. We're not going to think about those right now. We're just going to think about the sort of the sort of classical protein which folds and has its function because it has that shape. That's what we're interested in right now. So the, the sort of last issue we have to address is um, how do we look at the unfolded state under conditions which favor folding? Right? Because I'd like to be able to see that. I'd like to be able to see both the beginning and the end of the process. Okay. So that's what we're going to look at, and we're going to look at how we can use tools from physics to do this. Right? So that's where I really come in here is as sort of a problem solver on the experimental side. Right? So all the work I'm going to talk about I did with biochemists because um, you know, no physicist will ever be as good as a biochemist at biochemistry if they're a good biochemist. Right? You know, my training does not lie that way. right? So I'm okay 
about biochemistry, but if you're going to do real biochemical work, you need to work with biochemists. I'll tell you who the biochemists are. Yeah. Okay. But on the physics side, you can start thinking about what's going on. And the first thing I want to talk about is why we might want to be able to look at one of these molecules at a time. Right, so this is the single molecule perspective. And to do that, we're going to look at actually single people. So here's a distribution of single people. This is from an article from Joyner in 1975. These are students at Penn State during the 70s at Bell Bottoms, right? Um, and what, what he did is he had his students in his class stand in bins. This is a histogram, actually, made of students, right, based on their height, right? So here, there's one, two, three. There's three students in that bin for height. Here, there's, okay, many more. I'm not going to count that. Right. And over here, there's one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, I think, nine students in that bin. Okay. And what you see here is there's actually a lot of information if you have this whole distribution, right? If you can actually measure each student's height, you see that there's two peaks here. There's a peak for taller people and a peak for shorter people. And that's actually kind of what we expect because we know there are two subpopulations in this group here. There's men and women, and men on average tend to be taller than women, right? So we've had, gotten some information out of this, right? We've been able to find something which we wouldn't have if we just had the average. Now the average, okay, you're wondering what this blue line here is. At one point, I actually counted all of the numbers, and I put the average in. So that's what the average height of this population is. So if you just measure the average, that's all the information you get, that the average height of this class is what this is. I don't know what the actual value of this is. But you just get the average. Now, one thing I want to point out is your normal biochemical measurement, that's what you're measuring. You're measuring the average. Because let's say I wanted to do a measurement, I would put some sample into a, a sample cell, Right? Let's say I'm going to do some fluorescence measurement where I shine in light and I get some signal out. I'm going to measure it. So I put some sample into my sample cell. That sample has many, 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 many molecules in it. I shine in light, it interacts with my, my sample, and I get a signal out. And the signal I get out is the average over all of those molecules in the sample. So in a normal sort of ensemble measurement, we'll call it, we're getting this information. What we'd really like is this information. One of the reasons we want it is that if I had this subpopulation here for short people, let's say that let's say that we did this at a military academy, which is almost all men, right? So we'd have almost all the population of tall people, right? And maybe they're they're now allowing female recruits and we have like three women, right? Okay. If we do a single individual measurement, we can still say something about the average height of the women. We don't have good statistics, but we can say something. Okay. If we do an individual molecule measurement for protein folding, we'll be able to say something about the unfolded state, even under conditions which favor folding. That's the analogy here. So that's what we want to be able to do, is measure each protein by itself and make something like this, but for, okay, not heights, and, and not from you know, a class from 1975. But that's the idea. Right. So that's our first goal. And so how are we going to do that experimentally? Well. Um, I want to look at one molecule at a time. I guess if I have a small enough volume I'm looking at, right, and I make the concentration, the number of molecules per unit volume, small enough. So it's, let's say 10 picomol, right? This is like, anyone ever heard of a homeopathic medicine, right, where you just dilute things until there's almost nothing left there? It's almost like homeopathic biology, right? So we just keep diluting our sample until there's almost no sample left. And then we set up a very small, detection volume, about a femtoliter, right, with an optical system. So you focus a laser really tightly. So we're going to do an optical experiment where we excite something with a laser. So we focus the laser tightly, and then we also play some tricks with the optics to make it so we're looking at this very small volume. And what we get is, okay, most of the time we get nothing, right? I made it so that the average occupancy in there, if I take the concentration times this volume, take the average occupancy, it's much less than one. So most of the time I don't see anything, right? Most of the time I don't see anything, but every now and then one of those molecules randomly passes through my detection volume, and I tickle it with the laser, right? And we get some signal back. We'll talk about how we get signal back later. So every now and then we just like go through, we get some signal back, and then it passes out again, and now we have signal from one molecule. So we have to wait a long time to get decent signal, I mean to get decent data, because you know, you wait, molecule comes through, okay, now we have one, now I have to wait for the next one, and we said most of the time there are no molecules there. Right, so that's okay. Okay, we'll, we'll deal with that, right? Um, because now we, we have data from individual molecules. Okay, so that's the first thing we want to do, is, is figure out how to measure individual molecules. The second thing we want to do is say something about whether or not they're folded or not, right? 
You want to have something like height in that distribution, something which reports on the molecules. Um, and so we're going to measure the distance between two dyes we attach. So our biochemical collaborators put two dye molecules in here. So these are large aromatic molecules where if you shine in light, you shake the electrons around right in this dye, and then out you get some colored light. Right? So if I shine in light here to so this one we're going to call the donor with the laser, I'm going to get out some green. Okay. If I excited this one we call the acceptor, I'd have to use a different laser, I'd get out red. Okay. And the reason we're doing this is because we can't just look at the molecules under a regular microscope. I can't have just take the light signal and, and make a picture because the size of the molecules is several nanometers. The wavelength of light is 100 nanometers-ish, right? Several hundred nanometers. And we know that we can't actually look at things and resolve them if we're looking for something which is a larger wave with a larger wavelength than the object. I want to give an analogy for this, right? So let's say, let's say I'm in a dark room, like I'm in this room and I want to see what's in the room, and all I have is beach balls. So I can throw beach balls and see how they bounce back. That's that's what I'm doing, right? So I'm throwing in photons, right? My photons is my beach ball. And I want to see how it bounces back, right? So I can probably tell that you're there, right? So I'm gonna like hit you with a beach ball and it bounces off. But I can't tell what you look like, right? I have no idea if you're wearing glasses. Right? It's like, you know, the beach ball doesn't know. The beach ball's bigger than your glasses. I can't resolve that. Right? So we have this kind of resolution issue with light in that the wavelength of light is several hundred nanometers, the size of our beach ball, and the features we're looking at are several nanometers. right? So we're never going to be able to just see them. So we're going to play this trick where we're going to use other information from the light, the color. Okay? And what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, I'm going to excite this guy, which is called the donor. And when the acceptor is far away, I excite it, and it doesn't really feel the acceptor being there at all, and I just get light out from the donor. So I excite it, my laser, which is maybe blue, 488 nanometers, and I get out some green light. Green light. Now, if I bring the two together, closely, close enough together, I actually can get a coupling between the two. Right? So that I excite this one, the excitation energy gets transferred to the acceptor. Okay? It's transferred because while those electrons are sloshing around in the donor, they're creating an electric field, and that electric field is felt by the acceptor. Right? And so the energy gets transferred to the acceptor, and now I get light out of the acceptor. Right? And that light's going to be redder. So when the things are close together, I get more red light, and when they're further apart, I get more green light. So now I'm going to use the color to report on this distance, or actually the ratio of red light to all the light out. Okay? And so we're going to make this ratio of the number of red photons we get out number of red, amount of red light intensity we get out, to the total amount of light we get out. Okay? And it turns out that if we work through the physics of how this works, we get this kind of very steep distance dependence. This is actually the first experimental paper where they did this. Stryer and Hovland in 1967. Um, we get this very steep distance dependence where this is around 3 nanometers or 30 angstroms here for the dye pair they're using. It depends on the dots. We can get the sensitivity in the nanometer scale. And then what we can do is we can put these dye molecules, like I said, onto a protein. Here's the protein we're going to talk about for the rest of the talk. It's the cold shock protein from Hermitaga meridima. We're using it because it's actually a thermophile and you find it in sort of hot vents places. And so it's very stable, right? And a lot of times when you work with protein, you have to keep one nice all the time. This one's actually, it's very nice to work with because it's, it's, uh, it's very uh, hard to kill, right? And so we're using it as kind of a test system for doing these kinds of measurements. Um, and we're going to set this up so that when our protein's folded here, these dyes are close enough together that we're going to be up here. We're going to get a lot of transfer. We're going to have a lot of, we're going to get mostly acceptor photons. And when it's unfolded and flopping around, we'll get around 50% transfer. We'll get about half of the light in the acceptor channel. Right. So now we've changed measuring distance into measuring color. So we're going to have the light come out. We're going to split it by color using a, a color selective mirror, a dichroa. And then we'll detect the intensity and be able to say something about the distance in there by making this sort of spectroscopic measurement. Right? So we've gotten around the issue of the wavelength of light and being able to see. Great. Um, so what's the data look like? Well, most of the time we don't see anything, but every now and then one of these molecules goes through. And now instead of seeing one spike, we have two. Right, there's one for the collection for the green light and one for the red light. Right. 
And so let's say we have an event here, and we say, okay, I'm going to count up all the photons here, and I had about 220 photons for the acceptor, and 190 for the donor, right? And I can make that ratio, the number of acceptor photons, compared to the total number, and I get 0.53, and then I'm going to put a tick in a histogram. This is just like our histogram of heights, right? And if we see peaks, like this, where I've got one peak here and one peak here, now we know that we have two populations, okay? So for this data, actually, one thing I want to point out here, okay, this is protein, which is anti-natrin, so it's going to be unfolded. So we see a peak around 0.5, which is what we expect. The peak around zero actually is an artifact, because I said we were going to label all the molecules with donor and acceptor, right? So for this to work, and me to not, and, and for, for this to really, okay, in an ideal world, all of them would have a donor and an acceptor, right? But if I talk to my biochemistry collaborators, I say, can you make all of them have a donor and an acceptor? And they laugh at me, right? Because like, I can make most of them have a donor and an acceptor. It's a lot of work, we can do it, right? But I can't make all of them. So what's gonna happen is we're gonna have ones which have a donor and an acceptor, well, ones which just have a donor, and ones which just have an acceptor. The ones which just have an acceptor, we don't care about because the laser doesn't excite them, right? So they can flow through and we don't see them. The ones which just have a donor, well, okay, so we excite the donor, we get a lot of donor light out, but we don't get any light from the acceptor because there's no acceptor there. So we get zero over something, and that gives us zero transfer efficiency. And so that's what we're seeing right here, this peak near zero. These are molecules which only have a donor, right? So we have, okay, so we're seeing subpopulations already, just not ones which we really care about. So we're seeing the subpopulation of molecules we labeled well, and the ones which were broken later. But still promising, right? We're on, the, we're on the right track. We're seeing subpopulations. Okay. All right. So that's great. Now the, the only thing here is that uh, what about the unfolded state? I wanted to get the unfolded state, right? And if I look here at my data, most of the time I'm not seeing anything, right? Look at the if you look at the time scale. This is a second of data here, right? The time scale for proteins folding is like a second to a mil like milliseconds to seconds, right? So I guess I'd get one, two, three, four, five, maybe five events in the entire time the protein's folding. That doesn't seem very promising, right, if I want to be able to look at the unfolded state. So we're going to have to come back and, and figure out a way around that. And to do that, we're going to go back to the early days of biochemistry, the very early days of biochemistry, where they wanted to do kinetics measurements, but they had really bad detectors. And what I mean by really bad detectors is the detectors were really slow. They had to look for a long period of time. Right, which is exactly what we have here. Right, we have to look for a long period of time to get statistics for this. So what they did um, is schematically this. So they would take, they would start a reaction, and then they would, uh, you know, so you start a reaction, and then you're going to have that reaction move in some direction, some distance, and you're going to keep starting reactions over and over again. What I want to picture here is that you have a conveyor belt, like at the Coke plant or something, where you're spraying stuff into a bottle to start a reaction, and that's moving down the conveyor, right? And what you say is, okay, if I go some distance over here, delta x, well, I know what time that was since the start of the reaction. I just take the distance and divide it by the speed, right, to get the time. Because the distance is the speed times the time, right? So if I take the, the distance and divide it by the speed, I'll get the time. And so I can say, I'm going to look at one point here later in my conveyor belt, right? And, okay, it's not the same reaction I've started, if you want to think about it that way. I've got my conveyor belt of beakers. But it's at the same time since the start. So if I keep looking at that point, I'll be like, say, two seconds after the start, right? Let's say four milliseconds, let's give you a better time for this. Four milliseconds after the start, okay, I get one container, it's four milliseconds after the start. I get another container, it's four milliseconds after the start. I get a third container, it's four milliseconds after the start. Fine. I'm still getting data from the same time since we started, okay? Now, okay, in the early days of, of biochemistry, they didn't use beakers on a Coke assembly line. What they did is they used glass tubing and they had the, the liquid flow, and then these measurements of cytochrome C, and if you look them up, they're great, because they use liters of sample, right? They had to use liters of sample to get these kinetics measurements where they're doing something to cytochrome C, right? We don't want to use liters of sample. That's, that's no good. Um, but we do want to have this flow give us our, our velocity. So what we're going to do is we're going to borrow from the semiconductor fabrication industry to make really small fluid channels. Right. So we're going to make these fluid channels. Here's a micrograph. That's a 30 micrometer scale bar. So everything here is much actually much smaller than the thickness of a human hair. Right. And what we're going to do is we're going to flow in our sample 
and we were looking at folding, so we're going to float it in a chemical which makes it unfold the DH ring, and then we're going to loop that out. What you're actually looking at here on the right is fountain penning. It turns out fountain penning is a great way of looking at, at these things to see what's going on, right? So we've got fountain penning, and I'm diluting it, and so here there's some mixing, and then later in the channel, I'm going to look, that's, that's a later distance. I know what the velocity is for the flow, because we're using very small channels and very low flow rates. The flow is very predictable. And if you ever turned on the faucet and you turn it on a little bit and the flow always looks exactly the same, right? And then you turn it on a lot and the flow gets all crazy, right? So we're very far in the regime of the flow looking the same, right? And so we can predict what's going on with the flow. Um, so we know what the, the speed is. And we trigger the reaction at one point by mixing and then we observe somewhere later down. This is our cone of light for our laser getting focused on there. And by looking at different places downstream, we're looking at different times. So we basically traded spatial resolution for time resolution, right? We were making spatial resolution into time resolution. But I can put my, my laser focus at exactly one point, or pretty close to exactly one point, and then I know what time that is. Okay. Now, okay, we do have to do a little bit of calculus, right? Because maybe now maybe the speed is a function of how, where we are in the channel. We have this change in shape. That's okay, we can do that. Right, we can do an integral here um, to find out what the time is. And so what we're going to do is we're going to put this little volume, which was set by our focus from our laser and some optics at different points of the channel, and then we can measure, one, take these time traces with the spikes and make histograms at each point in the channel. Okay? So here's the inlet that's before we mix. Right? Here's right after we're mixing, this is 4.6 milliseconds after mixing starts right after the mixing starts. So it's 4.6 milliseconds into the reaction, 8.1, 28, 50, 94, 0.27 seconds, 2.6 seconds all the way through. And then what you'll see is, okay, so here's our, our friend this peak at zero, which just comes because we have things which have a donor with no acceptor, so we're gonna ignore that now, because it's not something we care about. That's just a labeling issue, right? But what we do see is, okay, we have, remember that high transfer values were close together, so that's folded. And low transfer values are far apart, so that's unfolded. So we start with almost all unfolded, just a teeny bit of folded. Okay? And then as time progresses, we've mixed out this denature, and we've triggered this folding reaction. We expect the, the folded state to get bigger and the unfolded state to get smaller. Okay? And that's what we see. So the folded state gets bigger and the unfolded state gets smaller. So far, so good. Okay. We can look at the area under those curves. Okay, because these are really so. These are histograms, but I also think of them as probability distributions, right? What's the probability that a molecule will be unfolded? Well, okay, I know sort of how big that is compared to that, I can tell you. Okay. And so we can we can look at the area under the curves, and we can plot here the folded fraction, which biochemists like to talk about. So this is the number folded divided by the total number. Right? And so we see it goes up, and we can get the rate at which it's getting bigger. Right? We can fit this to an exponential, and we get the rate the kinetics. So, so far that, that's nice. Um, I guess I could have done that. I could have gotten the rate from a, a regular ensemble measurement though, right? I could have. So what can we get out of this which is different, right? Well, just like for the histogram before, what I can do is I can tell you that here there's no intermediate, right? So you might imagine for folding, right? I've, all, I've drawn it like this, right? That you have some unfolded thing, right? And then you go straight to some nicely folded shape, right? But you could imagine that maybe you have some unfolded thing, and then it's going to go to some long-lived intermediate, something on the on route and stick there for a while. And then it's going to go to some nicely folded shape. If we had something like this intermediate, we'd see a peak in between the folded and the unfolded. Right, so here we have an unfolded peak, I've got a folded peak, I don't have any peak for some intermediate distance. Right, so that's one thing we can do with this kind of measurement. Um, the other thing we can do is that we can see here right, that there is some rearrangement which happens pretty quickly once you start, once you start uh, mixing, once you're out of this DH ring. You quickly go from being in this sort of extended state to this more compact state. Right? This is really basically a solvent effect, though. If you want to think about this as a polymer physics, when I'm in guadanium chloride, which is what we're in here, right? there's different salt. The, the, uh, the molecule likes to sp spread out more. 
right, than when you're in sort of buffer, basically one, right? So we had this sort of quick contraction as all the hydrophobic parts of a molecule try and hide themselves from the water, right? That's called the hydrophobic collapse. It happens faster than 4.6 milliseconds. Theoretically, we know it happens actually much faster than that, but this is pretty close to, we're sort of getting towards the limit of being able to actually see that. We're still pretty far away. I'll say that. We're still pretty far away, but we're closer, right, um, than, than we have been before. Um, one thing I'll point out about this is this is about, it's more than a factor of 10 faster than the previous measurement. So, so we are closer, although still far away. Um, so we can see that, but maybe the most interesting thing in this whole plot, okay, the most interesting piece of data in this whole plot, we've got all this data is here. That histogram is the most interesting thing in this whole plot because there, I have a distribution where I mostly have unfolded proteins, right? But they're in conditions where proteins like to fold. Now, we found a way to make unfolded proteins so we can measure it in native conditions, right? Now we can do whatever measurement we want to. Now that we have this data, we can go back, we can make up a new sample, right? I can even make the concentration of the sample higher, so I'm not doing a single molecule measurement anymore. And if I look at that point under those flow conditions with that dilution, I know that almost all of my molecules are unfolded. So now we can start doing other measurements on that point, right? So that's like, if we come here, okay, so did all the short people have better bell-bottom pants, right? So now what you're thinking is, okay, let's say that we have a condition where we're only gonna have short people, right? So we're gonna just be able to look at the short people here, and now we're gonna be able to like, check the bell bottomness of their pants, right? That's like our measurement we're going to make on our, our 1975 district, right? And with the bell bottomness of their pants, right? So, um, this is Penn State, right? So you can ask your parents if they have it. Penn State 1975. They could be in this picture. <laughs> I don't think so. But, but yeah, we could ask a question like that, right? So we can say, okay, now I want to know something else, right? And we can do that for this thing. We can do that here without even having to make a single molecule measurement because we know almost all the molecules are unfolded, right? And so, um, for instance, we can do things like we could look at how the signal, our fluorescent signal, correlates with itself, right? So we have some measurement of distance between the donor and receptor, and we, if we look at the correlation of that signal with itself, it'll tell us something about how the molecule is moving, right, in and out. And you can do things like talk about, okay, unfolded state moving in and out, is there friction inside the unfolded state which is affecting how it moves? Maybe that's going to be a limiting factor for protein folding. Maybe there's actually some internal friction which is going to slow down the process. You guys question how fast can we get? Yeah. Can it be friction on the molecular level? I thought. Okay, yeah, so internal friction, the way what you're saying there is you're saying that um, friction. So friction is things rubbing against each other, right? So the, the idea, what you're saying there is, okay, what you're really saying is you have different parts of the molecule which stick to each other a little bit, so you start transient sticking between the molecule and itself. It's really, so they call it internal friction, whether or not we want to be, it's the term in the literature, but yes, you have a point, right? That we sort of think about friction as being sort of two surfaces, but even there, the friction between two surfaces can involve sort of transient bonding, right? Like, hydrogen bonds, right? So it really is kind of the same thing, right? So you sort of transient bonding and stickiness, right? And so you can start getting at that kind of kind of question, right? So this is a, from a, a paper with some collaborators at home, um, which I will now tell you what they are, right? Because we're getting close to the time. So, uh, so I think I, I, what I've hoped I've, I've, I've sort of told you is sort of why a physicist might be interested in molecular biology. So this interesting problem about protein cell assembly comes up, right? Um, and it's a sort of a classical biochemical problem. And what can a physicist bring to this? Well, we can bring sort of a set of analytical tools. So there's a lot of math which I did not talk about because it's, it's not the right talk for that, right? Um, and there's a lot of sort of experimental tools you have as an experimental physicist because we're sort of trained to do this kind of thing. And so the molecular biology, right? Okay, so we are problem solvers physicists, right? But that's what we do, we solve problems. And we have a certain tool set we can apply, and you can apply that tool set to anything you want to, really. And I think right now biology is one of the most exciting things out there. So you're seeing a lot of sort of physicists as, I don't know, immigrants or refugees, if you want to put it that way, into biology, where we're going to use our experimental and theoretical tools 
to look at interesting, interesting problems. Of course, we have a lot of help, right? So I am not very good at growing up proteins. I've done it. I've grown proteins. I've, made, I've expressed proteins and like purified them and all that. But I, I cannot troubleshoot this process very well at all because I'm just not trained that way. Um, and I'm not great at doing the labeling. And we have to get those dye labels in there, right? And that's actually, that's tricky. Get, getting them in is not so tricky. You get them purified and getting them in so you really have one donor and one acceptor, that's tricky, okay? Um, and so we did a lot of this work. Okay, so here's sort of the physicists on this project with me. And then here's all the people in biochemistry, including uh, Ben Schuler at the University of Zurich. Um, he's sort of a phenomenal biochemist. Uh, so that's sort of the, the idea of, of who was involved in this. There's a lot of people involved in this, this, this project. Now, the last thing I want to do before we go to questions, right, is just to, okay, so I, I'm, I'm from Westchester University, which I know a lot of people transfer to, right, so we're here, and so I'm going to shamelessly plug university here for just a second, right? So we have three programs. There's a Bachelor of Science in Physics. We have a Bachelor of Science Education. It's a, if you are physics interested, the, the, the employment for physics teachers, their unemployment is almost zero, right? Especially from our program. Um, we have a free two engineering program if you're interested in that. And I put the URL here so that I can shamelessly plug in schools just a little bit more. Right? So, so do come by and see what other people are doing. If this doesn't excite you, maybe something someone else is doing on the faculty well, right? Um, and with that said, I'd like to take your questions about anything we've talked about. Yeah, and I've got a question. So you're able to, using the tools of physics, monitor protein folding. If protein folding goes wrong, what kind of problems does that cause for the organism? Okay, so the great thing about biology, or maybe the bad thing about biology, is anything goes wrong, there's a disease, right? Because like, you know, anything goes wrong, your cells, that's bad, right? So you know, like, if something goes wrong with replication, you get cancer. Okay, so the diseases which are most commonly associated with protein folding are neurodegenerative diseases. So there's some implication, and I need to check up on the, the literature again, because there was, a while ago, some implication for Alzheimer's, but I think it was sort of being kind of, it was contentious at the time. But neurodegenerative diseases are one thing. I mean, anytime you have misfolded proteins, that's an issue, and one issue with misfolding proteins is that, uh, they don't just misfold and go to the corner, right, and like stay with themselves. So, you know. so they misfold, and then you have something which is un which isn't folded right, floating around the cell, getting to things, and they can stick to it. And you can get aggregates, right? Oh, so which is unfolded protein, and it's going to stick to something else, right? Let's say it has a one of these hydrophobic patches exposed, right? So it's going around with this hydrophobic patch exposed, and then like you know, there's some other protein which has its hydrophobic stuff buried, should have its hydrophobic hydrophobic part buried, and now like this thing hits it, and the hydrophobic part sticks, and now you've got some big Sean is a junk what that what they found with Alzheimer's disease. So, so okay, so they found plaques and that made everyone protein folding very excited. But the question but there's a real question about whether or not these plaques you have of proteins are actually a symptom or a cause. Right? So I don't know if proteins misfold in Alzheimer's because you have Alzheimer's and that messes everything up. Or if protein misfolding in Alzheimer's causes Alzheimer's, or if you start having Alzheimer's and then proteins misfold and then that makes things worse for you and you get worse Alzheimer's. So, so that's kind of an open question. I don't want to sell that too hard, right? Just because it's not really, the cause and effect relationship is not so clear. Right? So I don't, want to, I don't want to sell that very hard. Right? Um, other questions about this? Yeah. Is it the actual sequence of the proteins that causes the folds, you think? Like okay, so it is, it is the sequence, them. right? So if you have a certain sequence of amino acids, you will get a certain fold, right? And it's actually, it's kind of amazing. In the cell, you can think that there are, maybe there's going to be some machine which folds proteins for you. Like, I don't know, maybe blue animal or something, right? But it's not the case, right? So we can take these proteins, we can unfold them, right? And then we can let them refold, and we get the same structure, right? So the, the whole idea that I can take these proteins and sort of chemically torture them to make them unfold, and then glued out that chemical and I'm going to get back the same protein is, is kind of amazing, but it's true, right? So it, it's really, the way to think about it is that okay, there's a local energy minimum for that confirmation, right? So it's the lowest energy state. So it's just like if you have a ball on a hill, it'll roll down to the bottom, right? The folded state for a protein is like the bottom. I'm simplifying some things that we're talking about the free energy really, not, not like gravitational potential. That's the idea. So you're rolling downhill to this bottom state, right? 
um, our current understanding of protein folding is that you sort of have some energy landscape like a hill and you're sort of bumping around on it until you reach the local thing. And how rough it is depend, tells you something about how how long it's going to take to fold. Things like that. Yeah. Um, I just came up with, due to your talk, of uh, an analogy to mathematics. There are two-dimensional grids of polygons that only certain of those grids actually fold up to three-dimensional shapes called polyhedra. And if you just misplace one polygon in that grid, it won't fold up and it'll behave strangely. Yeah, there's something. That, I mean, one thing, okay, so of course, like everything else in biology, nothing makes sense unless you have natural selection, right? So proteins are selected to fold, right? And they're selected to fold in ways where they don't misfold that often, right? Um, and so it's not, it, it's, uh, it's, there's this thing called the Offensive Offensive Paradox, right? Which is that if you had some random chain and you just figured out how long it would take to find a, a certain shape, right? It would take very long, way longer than it takes proteins. But for all these proteins, they fold them in millisecond to second time scale. So we know that somehow they're designed not only to fold, but to fold in a reasonable period of time for the same. Right? And by design, I mean it here, I mean have evolved. Right? I don't mean design, I mean evolved. Right? So I have to be careful because it's biology, I'm a physicist, right? But I mean evolved. <coughs> 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 What kind of what? Lasers. Lasers, Lasers? okay, so uh, mostly solid state. Uh, so 488 nanometers is usually a good choice. It depends on the dots you're using. So you have to have dots which are really bright because your signal's limited, right? So you have to have a high quantum yield. Uh, the two most popular sets are the Alexa dyes and the cyanide dyes. So Psi 3 and Psi 5 are one popular set. And then Alexa 4, 48, and 594 were used here. So you use a 488 nanometer laser for the uh, pump, yeah, sort of power. Okay, so it's not a lot of power actually. Like, so you only need maybe, uh, going into the back of the objective, you only need like a couple milliwatts, right? So a laser pointer would work if it was, a, a laser pointer would work if it was stable enough, right? And it had nice stuff beam characteristics because you're focusing down to such a small spot that the flux of light going through the spot is actually pretty big, even if you have a couple milliwatts. So, um, uh, so, I mean, really, it's not even milliwatts, it's more like a couple hundred microwatts in the back of the injector. Like you, you, could, you could use, like, yeah, if they, if, they were, if they had nice enough optical properties, you could, right? So you typically end up using sort of the cheapest solid state laser, which has decent properties that you can get, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so if proteins are formed naturally inside the privacy, Okay, so there's actually, so th that's an interesting question. So all this work is, is predicated on the idea of having the, the, the protein fold uncoupled from translation, right? So you know there's translation going on making the, the protein. And so the justification for that is that proteins unfold and refold naturally during their life cycle. So we know they have to be able to do this. Uh, the first time a protein folds, it's actually probably folding as it comes off the ribosome, right? So you have the ribosome here, Right, with its big unit and its small unit, and then there's the A, P, and E sites, right? So you're having bonds formed here, and there's an exit tunnel, and here's your nascent polypeptide chain coming out. So that's your, your chain of, of amino acids coming out. And you know, this, there's nothing which says this can't start folding as it comes out, right? And for larger proteins, I'm, I'm sure it does for large multi domain ones, right? So there's a, another issue there of how adding amino acids to this chain might be coupled to protein folding, right? That's another question. You can use similar techniques to look at the ribosome. It's actually, okay. so for my postdoc work, I did look at the ribosome, single molecule fluorescence, right? And so what you can do there is you can label, say, the, you can label the tRNA coming in here, so here's one dot on a tRNA, this is tRNA coming in. And then here, you can label one of the proteins in the ribosome. Right, so you label the protein in the ribosome. You can actually grow up sort of sick ribosomes, which is a protein. They'll still work enough so the cells don't die, right? And then you label the protein, and then you introduce them together, and get the protein to reintegrate into the ribosome. So now you have another dye here on one of the proteins, and now you can look at 
how the TRNA is coming in and its proximity, right? Because again, if they're close, you get energy transfer. If they're far away, you don't, right? And now you can start looking at the way the ribosome works. Uh, what people haven't really done yet is to be able to do this at the same time as they look at what's going on with protein folding. Because it's hard to figure out how you're going to label the states of shape coming out and what you're going to I'd have to label more than one spot to talk about the distance in there. And that's, that would be a great thing to do. I would love to do that. Sean. That's beyond my biochemical skill, for sure. And I think most people actually. So, yes. you're able to monitor protein folding. Does that lend any insights into why the protein doesn't fold properly and give, therefore, some insight into potential cures for disease? Okay, so one, one, one thing which you'd be interested in is, is if you have an intermediate like this, which isn't the folded state, whether or not this is going to be uh, prone to aggregation, right? Because you could imagine that the protein's folding, it has the state on the way in, right? And then while it's folding, the state, which is sort of partway through, is maybe more prone to getting interrupted by something. Right, because the folded state shouldn't be, right? That's what's in the cell, right? That should be pretty robustly okay. Right? Evolution should take care of that. If your folded state, your natural state for your protein is going to have trouble, then as an organism, probably you're going to evolve a different protein, right? Yeah. But if you have some state along the way, which is maybe more prone to being having aggregation, well, this isn't there that long, right? And so you can imagine the sign's going to go wrong here. Of course, if we knew exactly how proteins folded from sort of like, if I could give you an amino acid sequence, put it on a computer and tell you exactly what's going to come out, then I think I can answer all these questions, right? Because we just we change the amino acid sequence a little bit and see what happens. Change the amino acid sequence a little bit, change what happens. And all the computational people would be really happy, right? And you know, they, they compute things and eventually be like, oh, if you, this happens, then you get bad things happen, right? So, so really the, the idea is to be able to get enough information to, to be able to do that kind of prediction from scratch. And we're not there yet. We've got, we, I mean, we know a lot more things. So we know how the energetic, sort of the roughness of the energy landscape, how that affects protein folding um, a little bit. Uh, we, we know a lot about some test proteins, right? Some sort of small proteins. Uh, and we're starting to see more general rules, but it's still kind of the stage of collecting information to be able to synthesize. All right, let's thank Dr. File. If you have any um, other questions, don't hang around for a while, so you can come up. And if you didn't sign the roster, come on up here and sign it, because I'm going to scan it and uh, send it off to all my colleagues. But we'd like to have an idea of how many people attended the talk, so whether you're getting extra credit or not, please come up here and sign so I know you attended. Everyone, colleagues and students and staff.